Guys, we're finally talking about Georgia spring football. And Jake Rowe, you had a pretty intriguing piece up today about Georgia's receiving talent coming aboard this spring and uh, the game plan for Mike Bobo and company. I was just just so excited to actually read guys' uh, names that are on this year's team again. The combine yeah. is one thing. The draft prep is one thing. All the other stuff behind us is totally different. But actually seeing this team is amazing. And seeing Lab McConkey's name and Brock Bowers on the page, it did some good stuff for my soul. Yeah, okay. So here's the thing. As a sports writer, as a, as a beat guy, as somebody who follows the team, you really want to kind of hit autopilot for a minute, right? Uh, that was a long season. And Georgia's done – you know, you get home from L.A. January 10th. Uh, Palmer and I basically – actually, we got home January 11th. Um, we basically flew all night to get home. And, and uh, you're sitting there thinking, you're like, two months and it's going to be it's going to be ready to roll again. And then everything that happened. I mean, what a terrible, awful, no good, very bad, uh, you know, month and a half there. And then, um, you know, right there – uh, you know, you, you start to kind of get into autopilot mode. Once all of that's over, you start to get into some of these early enrollee profiles, some stuff that you've kind of written over and over again. You get to share some opinion. You get to share some uh, – uh, you get to kind of editorialize a little bit and, and talk about these guys and, and what you've heard and what you know about them. And then, bam, you're sitting here at spring break. Spring break at Georgia means spring practice is about to start. And, uh, and you start writing about the storylines. And – Honestly, um, it's the first time in a long time I felt like we had more storylines than we had days of the week leading up. May may even go into Monday. Normally, I just kind of go Monday through Friday, the week leading up, and uh, that's it. But uh, this year, we're focused on uh, we're focused more on uh, uh, you know kind of the five days, and and may have to go to a six just because there's so many storylines. And there was receivers are one of them. Let's get back to that in just a second. No, we've got a uh, we've got the man. We're going alive. We got a live pop in from Palmer Tom's. I peer it looks like a him. fake background. I <laughs> really the green screen. I yeah. peer pressured Palmer to join the show. Uh, Palmer's wow. at the SEC tournament in Nashville at Bridgestone Arena. Palmer, what's happening at the Stone? Uh, well, right now we've got Ole Miss in South Carolina playing. Two thirty-one left in the second half. 63-56 on Miss. Georgia and LSU in the game to follow. Um, and we've got a really loud Ole Miss band going as well. I don't know if y'all can hear that. Um, but, yeah, Georgia fighting for their life. It's win or go home for them every game the rest of this week. If they, uh, they can win five, they're in the NCAA tournament. If they lose any of those leading up to that point, they're probably not playing any postseason basketball. Yeah, it started out pretty promising for Mike White's team. I'll let you go after this one, Palmer. I know uh, you want to get locked into the game. You got to get settled in and kind of keep your tabs on what's happening on the court there. But Mike White views this yeah, tournament I mean, as a uh, – well, you can't, you can't show that on the air, Palmer, so let's not get uh, <laughs> – let's not get Greg Sankey to kick us off of YouTube. Uh, yeah. What was Mike White's perspective on starting this season over, essentially, as the dogs get into the SEC tournament? Yeah, he was excited about the opportunity to come here and, and have a fresh start. Um, you know, weirder things have happened. Uh, you know, anybody's got a chance. Um, you know, a zero and zero, all the cliches, bring them out for the Bulldogs um, because they are using them all. They know that they haven't played their best basketball of late, uh, losing five in a row, league high coming into this uh, tournament. And, um, you know, they're the 11th seed. They're the better-seeded team. They beat LSU earlier this year, uh, about a month ago today. It was actually their last win, but they're the underdogs tonight. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's an understanding that things have not gone great as of late. But uh, that they have played good basketball. And if you look at it, I mean, they play – I'm not saying this is going to happen, but they play LSU. They beat LSU. They play Vanderbilt if they win that game. They probably should have beaten Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt shot 50% against them. And then they play Kentucky, who they split the season series with, uh, and, and won the last time against them. So it's, it's a favorable draw for a team that's losing five in a row. Look – 
we're going to chop wood about it, or at least I am, when we wrap up the show here. Palmer, there's a young Tennessee fan behind you looking for a uh, defense on football. So I, I wish him the best of luck back there as he Tennessee looks man. around the arena. Palmer, uh, thank you, man. Best of luck. Follow Palmer Toms on Twitter for live updates from the game and also join us for more uh, in-depth analysis on the board over at dogshq.com with a premium membership. You don't want to miss out on that, $29.99 through August 31st. All right, so what if, Georgia what if tips Greg off. Sankey, what if Greg Sankey had walked up behind Palmer after he turned that thing on the floor and just kind of shut him off like with the little hey. neck grab there? Wait, he's back. What? He's back. So, I thought I pressed uh, the button. What happened? So Greg Sankey you, got him. Greg Sankey's supposed to be in the seat right in front of me. Turn All the right, camera well, just take, take a picture of the back of his head and send it in or put it on Twitter, and we'll live stream it tonight. He's, he's not there. Ask for comments. Hey, see if you can get him on Bark in the Dark. <laughs> Bark After Dark. Bark After Dark, sorry. You don't even know the name of your own show. All right, here no, we go. Um, all right, Georgia Always tips fun. off at 9.30 p.m. If you're listening to this on a replay, you already know what happened. Georgia won the game. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, Georgia lost to LSU. That'd be the, right, that, that, that's that's the expected happened. outcome, buddy. <laughs> Anything can happen. You said yeah. both, though, and now, now, now everybody's getting what they need. All right, let's get um, back right, to the original back programming. <laughs> back, yeah. back to the uh, football talk. The receiving well, stop picture for this. Georgia starting to take shape this spring, Ro. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, that, that's what I was kind of – you know, my long-winded way of getting to it was – you know, I started thinking about the storylines for the spring. You got a quarterback competition. Uh, you got, you know, reloading in the secondary. We've done both of those. Today uh, was the receiver's turn. And um, listen, man, I don't think enough was made and, and didn't have enough time to really do it uh, because of everything that went on. Uh, but of George's addition to Dominic Lovett, um, you know, I've heard quite a bit now uh, to this point that, uh, you know, this guy is um, – you know, he's the real deal. And Georgia fans saw it up close. They saw Dominic Love and kind of car- love it, love it, kind of carve him up for a couple of quarters there in Columbia, Missouri. Um, he had some big games this year. He was one of the best receivers in the SEC. Um, I think folks are going to be really satisfied with him. Um, I think Ra Ra Thomas is a big addition and he's cleared his legal hurdles. Um, uh, you know, I don't know the situation. I'm not going to sit here and comment on it and act like Georgia's doing the right or wrong thing. Um, you know, I think they've investigated it, they've booted guys. Uh, um, Jake Roos is way up in my face right now. I mean, that, that, we were so close to that camera. <laughs> I was looking for something over in my mail slot and didn't realize we'd gone back to the three person look. Jake Roos yeah, streaming man. his broadcast from a also, spy this, head, this, this head's tough to keep in the frame, buddy. Yeah, I could, uh, I saw a tonsil, uh, but it, uh, <laughs> You know, Rara Thomas is a good addition. I like the I like the three freshmen. I, I like the boxes that they check off there. I mean, they've got a big physical guy that that's runs probably better than than you realize. Um, there in Tyler Williams, they've got Anthony Evans, who um, you know he's a blur, and then they got a kind of an all around dude there in and Yazid Haynes. And um, we've kind of gotten to all of those guys that I've mentioned at one point or another through some story. And uh, Georgia's wide receiver position is is primed in a really good spot, despite losing Ad Mitchell and despite losing Kiaris Jackson. I'm probably more excited about Georgia's wide receiver uh, class in 2023 than I have been about one in a long time. I think that there's a lot of potential in that group. I I've made no secret of it. If you've followed this channel, if you followed these shows, I think Tyler Williams is real deal uh, Holyfield man. I think he's I think he's a dude that can be a dude. Uh, at the next level. Yazid is one of those dudes who kind of flew under the radar for a long time. And then, like you said, with with Evans, it's just all about speed. I mean, he's a guy who brings that element to it. And uh, how and great Yazid's, And Yazid's got plenty of it, too. Oh, no question. Absolutely. I mean, Yazid, from a pure athleticism standpoint, his measurables check off. I mean, his broad jump was huge. I think he had a really nice vert, if I'm not mistaken, at Penn State camp last year. Um, you know, Tyler Williams, though, I think the guy with the big ceiling because he's not been playing football for more than two or three years. Um, he was a long time basketball guy. I thought that was his future. And you see some of that translate over, I think, when you watch his tape. So I, I really, really love that freshman class for Georgia. I think that there's a lot of upside in these guys. 
This isn't – listen, I, Lad McConkey has turned out to be an outstanding player, but it, it's not like they were taking these late these late fine guys. You know, they they identified some really big-time guys, and, you know, Yazid was one of those guys that they took, and then everything sort of skyrocketed for him in his uh, senior year, I think like 1,700 yards or something like that. Um, some Some real potential in this group. Uh, we will definitely devote more time to this topic on a later episode because I think it's worthy of its own block or two. Um, but with Georgia having a new quarterback and a new offensive coordinator, when you look back at Alabama, because Bama's the standard, they've only had a couple seasons where they've replaced an OC and a quarterback and still gone on to appear or win a national championship. Um, that that's kind of the X factor for me. That's the other side of this sword of this double edged blade for Georgia's receiving core and its quarterback position is how do you get that many guys in sync with the quarterback and understanding what Mike Bobo wants to do on offense in one off season that to me will potentially make or break Georgia's success on offense. How well all of those individuals and those units uh, handle that transition. I think the number one thing there is is you you maintain a level of continuity. I'm not, uh, you know, listen. I, I have I've said this all along. I think I think the offense is going to stay similar. I don't think it's going to be the exact same. I think it's going to stay similar. Um, and I think the terminology is definitely going to pretty much stay the same. And I think that really helps the learning curve there. I think the Bobo thing is a little bit of a non-factor as, as compared to the new quarterback. Um, you know, because listen, uh, you know, I had somebody bring it up to me the other day. I mean, to bring it up to me yesterday, you know, Todd Munkin is in Baltimore and that's not looking like the greatest decision right now because, you know, Lamar Jackson's situation is going on. My God, at the, at the stir that has Ooh. caused, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too deep into it, but I mean, um, you know, there's only one franchise given fully, fully guaranteed contracts to quarterbacks and, that's one of the worst there is. So uh, sorry, Roos. I know that you you don't you root for a couple of doozies, buddy, um, in in the Browns and the and the uh, Falcons. But uh, you know that was a uh, that's looking like an all time screw up there. Uh, what what they did for Deshaun Watson and and he wants. Come on now, Come on now. you're it's not like not like the Broncos are looking genius for Russell Wilson either. Bro. Hey man, Super Bowls, kiss the ring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I need to I'm find ready. a team. Uh, the Falcons and I are on a break. Yeah, I would. I'd go on break with the Falcons all the time. See other people, uh, but yeah, I mean it's. It, but still, I mean, you know, Todd Munkin. Okay, so why did he make the move? Well, he doesn't want to recruit. Could part of it have been the quarterback situation? I don't think so, man. Because Carson Beck looked so much better last year when we saw him late in games, and it means something because he didn't look that good the year before. It showed improvement. So I think the quarterback thing is a little bit more of an issue than anything else. Uh, also, simply because. Georgia can't really settle in on a guy. Uh, they can't. Uh, you know they would love to. You know they would love for like Gunnar Stockton or Carson Beck or, or, or Brock Vandegrift to come out this spring and be like, this is my job. You cannot deny me. You know, and, 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 and do that with their play. They're going to have to deny him. They're going to have to be like, mm-hmm. hey, we got to take this in. Oh, man, this is going to last into, the, into, the, uh, into camp. This thing's going to last into the season because they really need to keep all three guys around. My, my theory throughout this and, and with the addition of the two transfer guys, I mean, obviously they're tremendous players, and I think they would have done it in any regard. But my theory has been that they're just trying to ease the curve for whoever's coming in. You give them as many good weapons as you can and figure it out from there. Give them as I many mean, weapons and give them as much time. I mean, there yeah. is the transfer portal factor that, that, that helps, but why not? see how you know how long you can go on this thing and let your guy have all the time he needs to figure it out but also just have a competition that gets heated and heated and heated and builds up more until the fall i don't know i was trying to do it for the mirror it looks like pi uh, is there a pass on. interference on the play <laughs> hold, on, hold on here we go 19 there you go 19 19 yeah. Yeah. That's all that matters. Brock Bowers. I still to this day contend that Stetson Bennett and Todd Munkin at Georgia were built by Brock Bowers. I, I'm the biggest Brock Bowers stand there is. I think he changes things in such a way that that you can't even imagine. You know, when you talk with other coaches and they're like, man, you, do, you don't know how hard it is 
when a team lines up in two tight end and you have to you have to play them as if they're in three or four different personnel sets because of what that guy can do. Um, and uh, there he is, the man. Um, and I'll tell you what, Georgia wins the third straight national title. He goes over a thousand yards. The greatest bulldog ever in my mind will be Brock Bowers. Uh, and, and, and he can cement that by coming back for his senior year, but I think he'll probably just be about as old as <laughs> yeah, he should really do that. I think he should do it. He should do it because <laughs> funny thing, you may not know this about Brock Bowers. He's a little bit of an old man. Like if Brock Bowers stuck around Georgia six years, like Stetson Bennett did, I think Brock Bowers might be 30. He's so, a time uh, traveler, man. Yeah, he he is. He's something special, and I think that's the um, that is the uh, he's like I put in the story today that he is the straw that stirs the drink. He, oh, he's going to be that way, and and that's the way it's going to be. That's been your that's been your go to phrase lately. Just so you're oh, it, it just is a little Reggie Jackson action, dude. <laughs> Uncle Glenn Hartley says, "Powered by Bowers." That's, that's right. a good catchphrase.